Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 15. Why I'm not a... <laughs> okay, I'm interrupting my own podcast. This is actually last week's episode, which I did not release last Wednesday on my normal schedule. I had some hesitation, and I felt I should pause and reflect. And here's why. Negativity in one person spreads to others like a forest fire, where fire jumps from tree to tree. When we interact and communicate our thoughts, we are doing more than just sharing words and ideas. We spread a bit of ourselves, too, our state of mind, our spirit. If you've ever spent time with people who have a dark, hopeless outlook, you can sense it. It wants to spread. The same is true for goodness and love. That's why a kind gesture, a thoughtful and unexpected moment of attention, is sometimes way more impactful than just the word or the deed itself. <laughs> I actually think that's probably worthy of an entire episode. So after I had recorded and began editing the episode, I began to struggle with some of the content. I have a few moments in here where I felt I may have pushed the humor or sarcasm too far. Here's the deal. Kevin's episode got me pretty energized. Fired up, maybe. I have Wayne Grudem's second edition, and I checked to see if he had corrected, or at least clarified, any of those rather disappointing things that Kevin found. He, he did not. And then, because I keep meeting so many absolutely wonderful people while doing this podcast, a lovely couple told me about a video that shocked them. They passed it along, and I had the joy of listening to it. Okay. It wasn't a joy. Truthfully, it made me angry. The stark contrast I experience between the people I interview and meet, those brave and often lonely souls who are willing to give up so much for the sake of truth, compared to those who write these books and produce these videos which are not just sloppy, but sometimes poorly argued, beholden to Catholic tradition, and vile, yes, sometimes vile, the contrast between the humble people I meet and these Christian leaders is stark. Here I am talking to people who, for the sake of truth, no longer can visit with their family, no longer have fellowship, and are living in relative isolation. And then I hear these other folks, like Fred Sanders, who admits the doctrine isn't even there, but will think nothing of dismissing these truth-loving people as not even Christian. <laughs> the people who preach Sola Scriptura condemn those who actually put it into practice. It's mind-blowing. Please understand, if you're one of our Trinitarian guests listening in, you may not be like this at all. I'm not describing you. But I would ask you to try and appreciate that this is a real concern. The vitriol is real. Listen, if someone intends to send people to hell and condemn them as, well, I'll let you hear it at the end of the podcast. If one is willing to condemn them for not believing a theory, they had better do more than infer and presuppose and defer to Catholic councils like, like Chalcedon for the proper guidance on how to think of the Trinity. When a Unitarian Christian actually confesses with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord and that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10.9, and when they explicitly believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the requirement of 1 John 5.11, then, well, well, maybe those aggressive agents of Christianity should pause. Maybe hold back on emotionally manipulating their congregations into a near hatred of us. Maybe hold back on sowing division between a husband and a wife. Maybe hold back at least just a little. Maybe instead pause and reflect, why is it that so many Christians today aren't even sure what the word Christ means? And some think it's his last name. Maybe pause and reflect why it is that honest questions from fellow Sunday school participants are being dismissed and shut down in their own churches. Perhaps pause and consider why so many of their own people if asked, can't even get this essential doctrine correct. Maybe these purveyors of anti-Unitarian rhetoric 
should ask themselves why the Trinity is the one doctrine that folks aren't allowed to question. Why does it have to be secured into place with fear? Why does it have to be protected so aggressively if it is so obviously laid out in Scripture? It's because the emperor has no clothes. And those who should know better know it. Fred Sanders knows it. But they all have to double down and fight and push and press to get folks to commit to this Catholic teaching when the folks barely know what they are committing to. Just words, mostly. Words that, if you ask them to explain, they usually explain wrong. Instead of suspecting something is wrong with the teaching, they'll write a book called The Forgotten Trinity, James White. What? Are we the only ones out there with our heads not stuck up our theology who can point out that doctrines clearly taught in Scripture are not things you forget? Why have we never seen a book, The Forgotten Resurrection? Uh, because it's actually taught in Scripture? Or has anyone written The Forgotten Crucifixion? Checking Amazon. Nope. So what's so special about the Trinity that has it ending up forgotten? Well, it's because when people just read their Bible and no one is there to teach them the correct presuppositions and the proper ways to infer things, they end up believing something much more like we believe. And what's special about the Trinity that has the teachers wrap it up in a package of fear with a lovely bow of condemnation on top? It's because the easily forgotten doctrine needs their help. And people thinking that they are free to explore this embarrassing corner of theological church history? (laughs) No, you do not want that. Condition them to recoil at the thought of investigating it, and you ensure it lives on for another generation. Okay, so I guess I was feeling a bit spicy when I put this episode together. (laughs) I guess I still am now. It's a bit like overturning money changers, flipping tables, using words. Though, after going back and listening to this episode with the extra week that I gave myself, it's probably not as harsh as I had thought. But I know some of you may not like it. I'm being transparent and honest. I've told you where I was mentally when I put these thoughts together. So now you know, and you are free to not listen. If you're a Trinitarian, please know that the extent of my impropriety is my sarcasm, my humor. It's how I process things. It's, it's not as typical of a style, I'll grant you that, but that is the extent of it. That's the worst of what you'll have to endure here. I will not attack you. I won't tell people to avoid you. I won't reach out to your spouse behind your back and advise them to distance from or divorce you. I won't damn you to hell. I won't call you demon-possessed. I won't mock you as a blubbering drunk. (laughs) No, actually, I'll listen to you, and I'll learn why you think what you do. I'll try at least. You'd probably have a great time discussing things with me because I don't treat you as a peddler of lies and damnation. I simply assume you learned things a different way, and that an honest discussion will serve us both to draw the truth out. That's what you get from me. That's who I am. I think this episode has just a few more moments of my my humor than maybe normal. I also have some lighthearted moments, so don't be too frightened. Oh, and my wife noted that I might have been trying too hard to be clever with a few words that I used, like a reference to bipedal, which has to do with walking on two legs, and exemplar, which I use to mean a standard specimen or an ideal model. So there, I've prepped you a little bit for what's coming later. Okay, and now now I've made my episode even longer, on top of being delayed, so I'm sorry about that. But at least you're going in with your eyes wide open. Now, back to the program. Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 15. Why I'm not a Trinitarian. I'm Mark (laughs) Cain. Okay, that's probably my most uncreative title to date. But I at least get some points for transparency and clarity. The UCA podcast is intended to help Unitarian Christians connect, grow, maybe laugh a bit. 
My intent is that we're encouraged and challenged too, to see beyond where we might be in our current situation and to press on. But I know some of you listening aren't Unitarian Christians. You're maybe along for the ride or maybe curious. It's nice to have you. You may want to go back and take in episode one to get some insights on us curious characters. Unitarian Christians are Christians who are convinced that the God of the Bible is Yahweh and he's the father of Jesus. That would make Jesus someone other than Yahweh. Jesus would be Yahweh's anointed king, sitting at his side. If you are a Trinitarian visitor, when you saw the title, Why I'm Not a Trinitarian, you might have had a suspicion you knew the answer. Like, it's because I was indoctrinated or lied to, or manipulated. Something along those lines. Oh, or I have a demon. And I'm not trying to convince you otherwise. You may already know that people who deny the Trinity are this way, so I must be too. Well, I'll grant you this. I was raised in a non-Trinitarian home and church, so yeah, it's possible my oppressive parents and cultish church brainwashed me into it. Sure, I have to allow for that possibility because I know that is a possibility. After all, Trinitarians can and do manipulate their people this way. I'd be blind if I thought Unitarian Christians were immune from falling into the same spiritually manipulative patterns. Any religious system can press its members into ideas that leave them trapped, unable to even conceive of or consider alternate views. This is a universal reality, and it's really, really bad. It's why I talk about it. It's why I made episode five. Uh, did God put coal in my stocking? If some other influence in your life supersedes what God is trying to help you understand, then you've got a problem. Be wary of handing your faith and beliefs into someone else's hands someone to take care of them for you. Be wary of power and prestige being focused on select individuals, like, insert current religious leader whose ministry has collapsed upon discovery of vile corruption. People are misled and abused every day under the guise of religious guidance, and I find it one of the most disgusting things perpetrated on people. Now, I don't think we humans are naturally immortal beings, so I don't see an eternal torment as a future punishment. But is it bad of me that sometimes I wish there was maybe just a small corner of the universe that God set aside to torment those who used his name to abuse the innocent? Well, I'm quite aware of the flaws we all have in common, and I'm quite aware that I'm not immune. So, why I'm not a Trinitarian? To the evangelical Christian, the most remarkable event in human history is that God himself stepped in to save us by becoming human, that God took the cross upon himself, that God paid the price. That's powerful. It's emotive. It's so remarkable, in fact, that this idea saturates the content produced by modern Christianity. And for good reason. Apart from creating us in the first place, saving us in this way is probably the largest single gift to mankind one could imagine. Yes, it is. In fact, I would be just like my Trinitarian friends if I too believed that God saved me by coming to earth and becoming a man. It would be part of my witness. It's how I would explain how the whole gospel thing actually worked. God coming to earth and paying the price for us would be the linchpin the key of doctrines. It would be the very fulcrum on which pivoted the fate of humanity. Kevin got me thinking about Wayne Grudem last week, so I checked, and sure enough, Wayne doesn't let me down here. He exemplifies this exact point. I think he speaks for most all of modern Trinitarian Christianity when he writes on page 700 of his robust and heavy systematic theology, second edition, it is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible, 
far more amazing than the resurrection, and more amazing even than the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to a human nature forever, so that infinite God became one person with finite man, that will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. Yes, the idea is that remarkable. It truly is. If this is how God saved us, then how could we hold it back? I get it. I don't fault any Trinitarian for referencing this extraordinary outreach of our God into our world and into our lives to rescue us. They should say what they believe. I expect nothing less. It explains why they talk about it so often and so passionately. This is why every Christmas story told by traditional Christian ministries, evangelicals, podcasts, it's why they all include this detail. If you're a Trinitarian, you get what I'm saying. Just imagine walking up to your pastor and asking him the simple question, Pastor Thomas, in a nutshell, what really went down on that first Christmas? You know his answer. He's going to tell you this amazing redeeming story of God's invasion into our timeline, him entering into humanity. Without a doubt, of course. This is what he believes. Now imagine how entirely peculiar it would be if he answered, Well, son, the Christmas story is that of the origin of Jesus, and I say that it'd be in Israel around 2,000 years ago. <laughs> You'd have a Stephanie Schlegel reaction. How can you say that? Like, he, he's God, like he always was. Episode 12. Uh, Pastor Thomas, did you say origin? Oh, well, Genesis, perhaps? Does that help? The Genesis of Jesus. Yeah, 2,000 years ago. Um, first, what do you mean, Genesis? Jesus is eternal? Th that's wrong in so many ways. And wait, are you saying it happened 2,000 years ago in Israel, this Genesis? Um, I'm having a hard time breathing. This is shocking and heretical? I'm going to the elders with this. They need to sit you down. You can't lead us with this inadequate, meager, incomplete, and impotent belief. You make Jesus out to be a man. You rob him of his eternal glory. Your supposed Savior cannot save us. It would be bad. And I think you're tracking with me. Now, a thought experiment. Suppose you had actually met Jesus, sat at his feet, witnessed his miracles, like saw him walk on water, forgive sins, and saw him alive again. Wow. Now suppose one day you looked around and realized, I have got to write this down. In another generation, people like me who met him will be gone. If I don't capture this amazing story, it may be lost. So you sit down with your pen, think back to all the things you saw and heard, your time with Mary, your time with Jesus and his brothers, and begin. The genesis of Jesus was in the city of Bethlehem, back a few decades when Herod was king. <gasps> You just shortchanged, no, no, stole from all future Christians the most remarkable detail of Jesus' advent. You should be ashamed. You, a first-hand witness of God's saving plan in action, and you chuck it all in the trash and make Jesus out to be a created being who appeared on the scene just a few decades ago. Well, yeah, it would be pretty egregious for you to depict the eternal Yahweh himself as if he was a created being like this, placing his Genesis ooh, at the time of Herod in the land of Israel. Terrible. Well, 
Unless, I suppose, maybe you didn't know what really happened. I mean, we might be able to forgive you if, during your years with Jesus, he never told you what actually happened. Or maybe we can let this um, horrendous mishap pass if you were out picking up lunch at the market that afternoon when Jesus let all of his followers know the actual story. Or, well, maybe we can overlook this appalling failure to bless mankind with the actual truth if you were the author of the Gospel Matthew. (laughs) Yeah. This degree of failure would be career-ending if it was your pastor. It would get you fired if you were the president of Moody Bible Institute. (laughs) But as it turns out, you get a pass if you are Matthew and had witnessed it all firsthand. Why? I don't know. You just do. This is exactly what Matthew did, including the word Genesis in 118, no less. And we don't even notice. Nah. Of course, we don't ask why he would do this, because no one talks about it. What's the big deal that a gospel writer completely bypassed the most profound miracle in all the universe? (laughs) Yeah, no biggie. If you're Trinitarian, you can be pretty sure this massive elephant in the room will get no mention. You will likely not be encouraged to consider this simple fact. The most profound event ever completely didn't occur to that gospel writer. The author who was determined to preserve the story of Jesus for centuries to come. Not even a blip on his, let's write this down, radar. We are conditioned to filter away troubling questions. Listen to Kevin George's story if you haven't yet, episodes 13 and 14. Listen to Hildy Chandler's recounting of how she would read right past verses which countered what she thought, episodes 2 through 4. Unitarian Christian or Trinitarian, you may think, No, I'm certainly not like that. I listen to what the text says and would never assume my own thoughts were right. The last thing I would ever do is fit the text into what I'm already thinking. (laughs) Never. Bullshit. We do it all the time. And we surround ourselves with people who agree with us so we don't even have to feel bad doing it. Our guilt, that momentary twinge of something isn't quite right, episode 5, is washed away because we have an entire denomination who believes this way. Shoot, if we're Trinitarian, we can point to centuries worth of famous, powerful Christian leaders who think this way. Why should we even remotely entertain the idea that we're misreading some scripture? It's preposterous and it would just get us into trouble anyway. Thousands upon thousands of people would not, no, could not be wrong on something so important as the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. Granted, one that took hundreds of years to actually formulate. Here's the question you probably don't want to ask if you're a Trinitarian, and I'll include it so you'll be sure to know which one it is. How did Matthew writing his gospel between maybe 30 to 50 years after Jesus, where the church had had time to mature, have many, many meetings, debates, discussions over their faith. How did he think that describing Jesus' origin this way was okay? It's like he thought Jesus was a man. It's like he didn't even comprehend the single most amazing thing to happen in the history of all of creation. Why didn't his Trinitarian Christian brothers stop him, or at least offer to proofread? So, the point of this episode, why I'm not a Trinitarian. It's because I'm a listener, and I hear what Trinitarians say. They truthfully speak what they believe is so, and they should. But what frequently comes out of their mouth is different than what I find in Scripture. They have a framework based on their belief that Yahweh, the God of creation, took on a human nature and lived with us for 30 years. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, Trinitarians constantly reference this amazing historical event in their gospel teaching. 
God came to earth. The infinite God became a man. Jesus walked on water because he was God. God died for us. It's the natural byproduct of that theological framework. They can't help themselves. So when I open the Bible and see Matthew entirely miss this event, I'm left with this observation. If Matthew thought like my Trinitarian friends, he would not have written what he did. He could not have written it. He would have been ashamed. He'd be fearful of lightning from heaven striking him down. His depiction of Jesus is so terribly misleading that he cannot have been a Trinitarian. Matthew, unlike Wayne Grudem, was apparently not basking in the amazing narrative of a God who personally comes to earth to save humanity in a human body. And that's just the book of Matthew. Mark says even less about this amazing incarnation event. I mean, he left off the birth. Then there's Peter in the book of Acts, his sermon in chapter 2. Uh, probably the single most toxic, cult-inspired, heresy-oozing message of the post-resurrection era. Of all the damnable things Peter could have said, he said the worst. Peter made Jesus out not just as a man, but as a dude from Nazareth. And he describes God as the one who did the miracles through the man, Jesus. Either Peter was the most confused Trinitarian ever, or demon-possessed, or he was saying what he actually believed was the truth out of the abundance of what was in his heart. Furthermore, if the apostles thought like my Trinitarian friends think, then when Paul and Barnabas healed the bipedally challenged person in Acts 14 and were then thought to have been the gods come down to earth, they would have certainly responded to the crowd, No, 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 we are not the gods that came down to earth. It was the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God who came to earth and joined himself to human nature forever so he could become one person with finite man. So you had the right idea, just the wrong individuals. Nope. They tore their clothes in shock at the mere idea. Paul and Barnabas, it seems, did not get an advanced copy of Grudem's book. They didn't think like Grudem thinks. How often do you hear Trinitarians talk casually about Jesus' God? <laughs> they don't. Some even hear those words and are shocked. You shouldn't talk that way. To a Trinitarian mind, those words can border on offensive. Okay, some realize that that is actually scriptural, so they aren't shocked. But even they recognize that you don't actually want to make a habit of talking that way. Why? Because it's very misleading. Yeah, casually referencing Jesus and his God, those words will possibly cause your listeners to stumble into damnation and hellfire. You don't want to talk about Jesus and his God. You need to be clear that Jesus is God. Having a God sounds quite contrary to being God. But, yep, the apostles don't seem to recognize this devastating faith impediment. They do talk this way. Apparently, whatever abundance in their hearts allow them to reference Jesus and his God without concern. And they don't even throw in the Trinitarian caveat exemplar in his human nature. Here, like this, in Ephesians 1.17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of, meaning, as unto, touching, upon his human nature, and only in a functional manner, for the blessing of our understanding of his assumed role, not in an ontological way or unto the common sense way in which the term God is used, that the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Nope, Paul here and the others, 
they leave all that extra helpful stuff out. And you'd think if Jesus was all on board with the absolute essentialness of the teachings of the Trinity for the salvation of mankind, he might have wanted to be more careful in Revelation 3 when he kept talking about his God. I mean, that kind of language can really get people confused on what should be the Godhead's proper co-equal aspects of their eternal triune loving relationship. It's, it's just really difficult for a typical reader of human language to hear that someone has a God and to not think of it in, in well, in the most obviously normal way. I know you probably understand my point here, but I've kind of always wanted to try my hand at being a standardized test proctor. Do you mind humoring me for a moment? Eating, drinking, and use of tobacco are not permitted in the test room. The use of electronic devices of any kind is not allowed at any time. Please clear your desk of everything but soft lead number two pencils, erasers, and your intracranial gray matter. The following behaviors are prohibited. Looking at another person's test booklet, giving or receiving assistance by any means, using outside reference materials, like sneaking Wayne Grudem's systematic theology book in your sleeve. Dang it! Hand it over. Dude, you got busted. Shut up. You have 45 minutes to complete this two question section. Open your booklet and begin work. Okay, uh, reading comprehension. Please read this short essay and answer the following questions. Okay. My Family by Mark Cain. I have been blessed by my God to have a great family. The end. All right. Question one. Name the characters in this story. A. Just Mark. B. Mark and his family. C. Mark, his family, and his God. Or D. An exceptionally multipersonal God. Hmm. All right, question two. According to the author of this story, who is this God character? A. No one. That was simply a swear word. No. B. Undetermined. The author was not at all clear. C. The author's God, the one with an assumed power to bless him. Or D. Mark is God. Hmm. I'll put the answers in the show notes. I actually asked a Trinitarian once directly, would you ever witness to someone and describe that you believe in God and in the man Jesus? He assured me he would not. Yeah, exactly. Trinitarians recognize that those kinds of words betray the very core of their powerful narrative, that it was God who had to die. Recall Kevin George's repulsion in episode 13 at the movie where Jesus was depicted as a man. Again, there is a distinct difference in how Trinitarians talk about God and how the New Testament writers do. I mean, consider this. If this non-Trinitarian view is so damnably bad, so terrible, so evil, can you imagine the horror if you took 1 Timothy 2, 5 literally? Like, if you thought that there is actually one God, and there is also a mediator, and that mediator is a man? Well, you've crossed the line there. Odd that Paul would write something so misleading and salvation jeopardizing without thoughtfully adding at least a few clarifying words about human nature and divine essence. Odd he wouldn't have just made it way more accurate and less heretical by simply calling Jesus a God-man. But he didn't. And you, you literalist, you need to be more careful. Now, a Trinitarian might think John 1 is the clearest thing ever. I understand. 
there are verses which you can read as totally supportive of your view. I'm not even going to argue about any of those today. I've heard enough people argue about grammar and terms and context that I know we humans are entirely able to squeeze our doctrines out of texts when we really want to find them there. For example, if you agree with one textual variant in this passage over here, then Jesus is called God. Ta-da! Trinity is true. Look, Jesus said, Ego and me, and I can make an argument that that might in some way be related to the Septuagint version of Exodus 3.14. Ta-da! Trinity is true. And not to be one-sided, you can see Jesus died and read that God is immortal and Ta-da! Trinity is not true. Or Jesus called himself a man, and in the Old Testament, it says, God is not a man. Ta-da! Trinity is not true. (laughs) Okay, listen, I am not trying to make light of the opinions people have on these passages or how they are interpreted. I'm pointing out that passages of Scripture can be argued about and have been argued about for years there are people who will make very carefully thought-out cases on both sides of these arguments. I think that's great. But I'm not a Unitarian Christian because of, say, John 17.3. I mean, I could be. It's pretty on the nose, John 17.3. But still, that's not why. I'm actually comfortable that verses here and there can be reasonably interpreted in ways which don't fit my framework. It's because my framework isn't based on select verses. I am not a Trinitarian because I am convinced that no one else in the New Testament was a Trinitarian. Debating individual passages is a valuable tool to find all the possible interpretations. And then, what do you do with these possibilities? You map them into what would be the largest and most plausible framework. I've found that the most plausible framework is not the Trinity. When I listen to Trinitarians talk, it reaffirms to me over and over and over again that what they think God is like is not what the disciples and the apostles thought. The points they feel compelled to make are not the points anyone in the book of Acts thought to make. And take, for example, one of the most popular phrases of Trinitarians. Jesus had to be God in order that fill in the blank. You'll hear this so often, you'd think it was on every third page of the New Testament. It's not. He had to be God to forgive sins, right? Well, not quite. God can give that authority to men, Matthew 9, 8. He had to be God to walk on water, right? Well, didn't Peter take a few steps too? He had to be God in order for us to be saved, right? Well, Paul could have included that point in Romans 5. He had paragraphs there to explain what Jesus accomplished. But Paul blew it royally. Paul called him a man over and over, and never hints Jesus had to be God. For Paul, a man seems to be a plausible means for God to bring about salvation. I've listened to so many Trinitarians explain how Jesus was able to save us, and it doesn't sound like this. Paul was a very poor Trinitarian. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A mental and theological framework will naturally produce certain kinds of output. It's like how you know something is a living organism. Living organisms make poop in one form or another. It's a great way to know it's alive. It consumes matter and produces waste. Stare at a rock for a few weeks, notice it doesn't make poop, thus you'll naturally conclude it's not alive. Listen to what people say. Listen to how they explain things. Listen to their output. If they produce different output than the apostles did, take note. If they celebrate the idea that God came to earth, but the apostles grieve at the same idea, take note. When they avoid talking about Jesus having a God, 
but the New Testament writers do it without a second thought? Take note. When they declare absolutes about what God can or cannot do, and these things are never said by anyone in Scripture, take note. When a Trinitarian pushes aside explicit scriptural language in favor of extra-biblical speculations, take extra careful note. You may think I'm just talking to Trinitarians here because maybe you're agreeing with me. I know that there probably aren't many Trinitarians listening, and that's fine. I'm sharing all of this with you because I think it can be of help. You can examine your own output. You can measure your own words against Scripture. If someone asked you a question like, Who is Jesus? Will your answers sound like the kinds of stuff you see in the book of Acts? where this very question was the hot topic? Check and see. Maybe someone asks you about some other doctrine you have, unrelated to our topic today. Do you have to struggle to explain it? Does your framework produce output, which is foreign to the behaviors or words of the New Testament authors? Do you regularly stumble across passages in Scripture which trigger your own caveat exemplars, like the one the late R.C. Sproul, the Trinitarian, has, he likes as touching upon his human nature. But maybe you have some of your own that you call upon repeatedly to fix what it seems the New Testament authors missed. Maybe they didn't miss something. Maybe your framework is defective. But maybe not. The fact remains that if you belong to a group that believes a certain way, you could have little to no reason to ever think differently. You will be supported in your view at every turn. And at the same time, you'll feel the subtle fear of ending up on the wrong side of the group if you start asking questions. It's sad, and I wish it wasn't so. But that's the way social group dynamics work. I'm suggesting you allow yourself to proceed investigating when you think something you've been taught may be wrong. Maybe you won't. Maybe that's too scary. But it's not bad to pursue truth even if others around you frown upon it. If you're really concerned, just don't tell them. Spend the time in your closet, not in Sunday school class. God honors a desire for truth, even if you're working in relative silence. Oh, unless, of course, you are fortunate enough to be born into the one group that has everything right. And honestly, you know you probably were, so you're good. Maybe suggest this episode to someone else. Yes, I was born into a Unitarian Christian group. I actually chuckle every time a Trinitarian suggests I get outside my bubble and expose myself to some Trinitarian thinkers. (laughs) Well, Why would they assume that someone of a particular theological view hides within a bubble, feeding only on the content of like-minded people? Why assume one would avoid material with which one disagrees? Mm, Oh, I don't know. Is it because that's what they do? I think so. I hope not, but I do think so. I think it's projection. They don't read non-Trinitarian books. So naturally, I am like them. I surround myself with only Unitarian Christians I agree with, and I plug my ears when someone starts to defend the Trinity. Well, shocker, it ain't so. Sure, I grew up in a Unitarian Christian group, but I've made a point to expose myself to lots of folks who disagree with me. I've given the other side a fair shake. Maybe one day one of these Trinitarians will ask, Hey, that's interesting what you're saying. Can you suggest a book that explains your views well? Well, it hasn't happened yet. Kevin also mentioned John MacArthur, a very well-known and loved Reformed Protestant American pastor. I'm going to borrow a little bit of John's teaching to put some real-world flavor on what I've discussed here. Again, I'm focusing on the output of the Trinitarian framework, 
how thinking that way results in things which are curiously dissimilar to what we read in Scripture. MacArthur has a short YouTube video, What Essential Doctrines Should You Look For in a Church? Apart from him including the Trinity on the list of essential doctrines, which, well, theories should not be elevated to essentials. Episode 1, The Perilous Trinity Deep Dive. Apart from that, Mr. MacArthur here reveals a glimpse of the natural output of a heart abundant with Trinitarian theological framework. Listen. What are the essential doctrines in Scripture? First, God, the nature of God. The writer of Hebrews says, he that comes to him must believe that he is. In other words, you come to God only when you come to the God who is God. So you have to have what is called theology proper, which is the study of the nature of God. That's the second very essential cardinal category of truth. So if you, for example, deny the Trinity, you have invented a God who is one, and that's not the true God. You're calling him God, but you're worshiping Satan or you're worshiping demons. False gods are concoctions of the kingdom of darkness. So you have to come to the true God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in nature, three in persons, the God who is revealed in Scripture. Okay, so I rummaged around my house and cobbled together a mate for my speculation buzzer. Episode one. A yin to my buzzer yang, a countertone to my buzzer tone. I needed an opposite, so I rigged myself an explicit chime. It should do. So, if you, for example, deny the Trinity, you have invented a God who is one, and that's not the true God. (laughs) Not to be overly critical here, but this might have come from Jesus' own lips in the context of uh, what's the greatest commandment, Mark 12, 29. You have invented a God who is one, and that's not the true God. You're calling him God, but you're worshiping Satan. Or you're worshiping demons. False gods are concoctions of the kingdom of darkness. So you have to come to the true God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, One in nature, three in persons. The God who is revealed in Scripture. Okay, this video exemplifies so much of what we've discussed here. Why the UCA exists in the first place. What honest Bible-believing people have to put up with. The exaltation of speculation and theory to a position of essential. And here, the apparent reframing of the greatest commandment into a form of Satan worship. People have ended up as Unitarian Christians for various reasons and in various ways. I'm not a Trinitarian because even though I was raised as a Unitarian Christian, I still felt it important to be sure. So I made a practice of listening to and assessing what others say. I've not hid myself from these conversations I actually think talking theology is very enjoyable. And I hope to make it interesting for others, too. It doesn't have to be angry and frustrating. What I've determined, then, for myself in my many years, is that Jesus' students were not Trinitarians. I trust them. I think Jesus placed great confidence in them, too. Thus, I'm content with not subscribing to the Trinity theory. And even if there are passages which are tricky, well, every theory has tricky passages, some more than others, but the existence of hard verses do not make a theory false. Maybe I'm still wrong, and I might be, sure, but when I hear Unitarian Christians talk about Jesus, man, it sounds like what I read in the New Testament. When I hear Trinitarians, not as much. And when they really try, like when they're pressed to be clear, it only gets worse. If what you naturally talk about, your natural output, if the abundance of your heart results in you sounding a lot like New Testament authors, then I think you're on the right track. 
A reminder, we have an Instagram account, uca.podcast. Each episode will get a quote or two immortalized there for posterity. Also, there's a Twitter account for episode announcements, at UCA Podcast. And there's an email list. Sign up at podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. In each episode's email, you can see the custom artwork larger, and you'll get some of my thoughts about the episode. If you have thoughts, feedback, questions, I'd love to hear from you. There's a record link on the same page as the email list sign-up form, podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org, and there's a link to record at the end of the show notes. I'm likely to include your thoughts in a future episode, because I like doing that. May God bless you in your... Just one extra insert here. If I delay an episode in the future, I'll probably do it just like I did here. I'll just hold back one week and pick up on the next Wednesday morning. I will announce episode delays on Twitter and the email list, if that's of interest to you. Coming up soon, a podcaster team from Europe, a visit with my older sister, and plenty more. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.